Leading from above the line is a philosophy that recognizes five sources of inner power. These sources of inner power are critical to our leadership development. They are principal consciousness, purpose, emotional mastery, understanding change, and knowledge empowerment. We have talked a lot about the first three sources of inner power and the process of developing our inner power, that is a process of self-introspection. Today we are talking to Dr. Theodore Ferguson, or Theo, about understanding change. You know, Theo, why is understanding change important to leadership? Yeah, I often get asked that question. You see, we live in a world that is continuously changing. Everything around us is changing. We ourselves are changing, our bodies are changing. And so often we live in fear of the change process. Okay. And when we live in fear of change, it shuts down our ability to think clearly and to see the world around us in the way it really is. And that clarity, having that sense of getting that perspective on what's happening around us is critical to having a mind that allows us to think more clearly. Okay. So, it, so it becomes a source of power for us when we can have that, that clear perspective on, the, on life and on the world around us. We've got to know where we came from if we, to, if we are to understand where we are. So a sense of the past. So you have to have a sense of the past. Mm -hmm. And if you have a sense of the past and you have a sense of what's happening now, you can have a sense of the future. And you can better put to your mind so that you are not surprised by change. In a sense, you can anticipate what is coming. Because you think you're on a, the world is moving on a certain path, you know. You just happen to be at this point now. You are living at this point in time. But the world didn't start to live when you were born. Right. The world wasn't here, sorry. <laughs> and it will continue even after you. So we are just transient right. in the scheme of things. And we have to have, and having that sense of wholeness in terms of where it started, where we are and where we are heading, gives you that a state of, um, of, of much greater calm in your life. Okay, so it's to manage ourselves as we deal with issues. But then Theo, you know, some of the issues of the world challenge us so much. You know, we see so much fighting, the wars even now. You know, how do we use this understanding of change to deal with this kind of massacre that we're seeing, if I were to use a harsh word? Yes, the world is still at war. Yes, we're seeing a lot of brutality in the world today. But when you look at it on a comparative basis to what was happening in the, in the world 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years, 500 years, or even 100 years ago, and this world today is much better than it has ever been. Something that is difficult for people to understand. It is. Yeah. <laughs> um, for one thing, let's take our life expectancy as human beings. Okay. Now, as human beings, um, in most countries around the world, we expect to live to at least 65 years. Some, a lot of us looking to go over 70, and there's some countries where the well into life, the 90s. Life, life expectancy is much higher. But that is recent, you know. If you go back into the past, into a bloody past, there was a time not too long ago when life expectancy was in the vicinity of 40-something years, and before that was 20-something years, because we are so brutal and so violent, that, and there were so many diseases and all of that, that human beings on an average didn't live for very long. So now we enjoy much longer life, but we still have brutality but yeah. not as much as we had before. Do you know the saying, the, the good old days? Yes, this is what many of us want, the good old days. Well, I would love for somebody to find those good old days. Because whatever the state of the world is today is much better than it was 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, 150 or 200 years ago. I want to take people back into the past. Then suddenly people wake up and say, wow, no, no, no. I don't really want to live in that world. Like I don't want to be in those good old no, days. No, no. Because so often we can't see what we have. And people say, but, and then when I see what we have and I see the progress that we've made over time, 
I can't help but be optimistic about the future because we have been on a path of helping the world to become better. And it has been, been, it has been, it has been um, getting better over the years. Eh? Why do we still then find that every generation decries the generation that is ahead of them? They, they don't know how to choose music, they don't do the right things, their morality is declining. Ah, sometimes we're so full of ourselves, it's part of the ego that expresses itself. Every future generation advances the world to a better place and has been shown in our history. If you want to go back and examine the history, it's there. So why don't we have confidence that the next generation will take the world to a better place? You know, there are a lot of writings in this world, a lot of people have written about this, who felt that their generation, that was the climax of civilization, go back to starting in the 1600s, come forward. Everybody thought this was the climax. And 50 years, 50 years later, another generation takes it to a better place. And 50 years later, another generation takes it to a better place. And that's been going on. And this, the young people of this world, I'm convinced, will take this world to a better place than we have taken it, people of my age have taken it. So I'm an optimist about the future. Because when I look at the, when I look at the, at the path of human development, to me it's very clear. We've been, we've been getting much better. So you're an optimist with evidence. A lot of evidence, right? And, and there's a few people out there who have written on this subject quite, you know, quite a nice way. Right? So, I think, it's, if I remember correctly, Stephen Spinkton, I think he's one yes. of those that has yes. a book on violence. And that the, the, the lesson in violence over time. Yeah. So when you is, study the half facts, there's no doubt. So the world is better today yeah. than at any time before. Any time in its history. Okay. And I challenge um, my participants in my retreats and so on. Go back into history and find a better state. Any time in on history, any dimension. And any time in which the world was better, and you bring it to us. Go back. I suppose if I were to think of one, let's, the environment, have we, was it a okay. better physical environment there? The question is, the real question is, uh, as human beings, do we have the ability to correct the wrongs that we've been doing with regards to the environment? Yes, we've been doing the wrong and we have been exploiting the, the environment. But under, at the same time, understand, the only thing that we have to exploit for human existence is the environment. So to say that we can't exploit the environment is, being, is misunderstanding the nature of, of our civilization. So the, the environment will change given the human beings in the world and the, own, and the needs that we have as human beings. Question is, can we manage the process in such a way that we don't destroy ourselves in the long run? And that's really the issue about the, the environment at the moment. And I have the confidence, full confidence, that we will be able to manage the environment of the world. We're going to come to our senses. Sometimes we take it right to the edge, you know. Yes, and then we wake up. Yes, remember we took it to the edge when we dropped those first nuclear bombs and yes. um, how many years ago? Hiroshima. Now? And all those yes. things for this, um, as well, 70 plus years ago. Yes. Have we dropped another one since? We learn quickly. We learn very quickly. Yes, the threat is still there. Mm -hmm. But we are, we're now much more aware of the dangers. So that, res that restrains our behavior. Mm -hmm. right? And I believe as human beings, we have the capacity to hold ourselves together and to do what is right and what is good over time. I had an experience just recently about understanding change where you know, blindness is something, if we think we're going to be stricken by blindness, it's a very fair, fearful experience. Mm -hmm. And um, talking to this blind person about all that he can do now, mm -hmm. you know, with all of the technology, he can use his phone, mm -hmm. listen to movies, mm -hmm. you know, and, and appreciate movies and so on. Life is much better. So is that an, an example of you know, if we were to really build this source of inner power of understanding change, would we be less in shock as I was? Of well, we, we live in less fear. We will understand that this human capacity that we have is, is tremendous and we can solve problems. Problems right. don't have to remain with us forever. Right. And it's, I mean, the way we're taking care of the, the, um, those who are not as able-bodied as us, 
but we, they have a place in the world today, a much better place. We don't imprison them anymore and banish them. All of that is part of the progress that, that we have. So how do we, how do we grow this source of inner power, this, to understand change? Heightened awareness of who we are. Heightened awareness of where we came from. You mean on a global uh, scale? Yeah. We have to look across the species. We have to look across ourselves and get into and recognize, wow, but we're part of something beautiful. Something beautiful is emerging in the world. Our humanity is growing and becoming better. We're not as, as, we're not, um, as evil as a society. Although the capacity for evil is still within us. When we see it being expressed in other countries in the world now that are involved in war. And it horrifies people, but that capacity is within all of us. Uh, and it's the capacity for good yeah. just as inherent in us? Well, we have a capacity to be evil, but we also have the capacity to be good. And our challenge is to allow that goodness mm -hmm. that we have to override the evil that we have within us. Okay. Let us not accept the evil as a given. As I hear some people saying, oh, this is the evil world, it's not going to get better. Mm. And you know, we have the doomsday groups that say, world is coming to an end soon. Mm -hmm. And we all must, I'm not in that league. I'm an optimist. Okay. I think we can grow humanity and take it to a beautiful place in time. Yes, we have challenges, but I think as human beings, we have the capacity to make the world a better place. Okay. Yeah. And let's talk about the future. How, you know, having a sense of where we came from, what is happening now, but how do we convince ourselves about what is going to happen in, in the future? Optimism is one thing, and yes, there is an evidence of some progress, but what gives us, what, what helps us to share this optimism? The truth is we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right. Take the internet, for example. Mm -hmm. I will never have been able, I'm not sure if anybody could have predicted the internet 50 years ago. Right. Right? And a lot of people try to predict the future. And um, the internet has, we have a world now that runs on the internet, literally. Right. It has redefined the world completely. What a, something may emerge that could redefine the world in the next 50 years, so it looks it's very different from what it, it is, is today. So, and we have to have a mind that allows us to welcome change and to be open to change. We can't block a mind to change. And none of us can really predict the future. But my optimism lies with the human being and the capacity of the human being to do good. That is where my optimism lies. Right. And the fact that we have the ability to bring out more of that goodness. And we have seen time. that over time. Of course, you go yes. back in the history, it's all there. Yes. And so we continue to progress. And if we've got to this point with our humanity, why should we lose faith in humanity to believe that we're, going, we're not going to advance, continue to advance our humanity? I think we've been given this potential, that we have this divine potential for a reason, you know, to be able to use it, exercise it, right. build a better humanity, which is what we have been doing. Okay, one other thing I want to talk about is the disconnect between generations. Okay. Right. And it's, it's, that disconnect has intensified in the, with the new, what I call, technology, more te technology-driven world that we're in. And that one generation, say generation, my generation, for example, very often disconnected with people who are 20, 30 years younger, and that generation is now disconnected right. with another generation. Because older generations very often don't take time to understand the changing nature of the world, even while they're alive. That's true. So they get disconnected from their own children and their children's generation. And when I, I meet people sometimes who will tell me they will never have a cell phone as though they're living in the 1970s or the 1950s. Mm. Right? Yeah. That's so a new reality. It's unheard of. Yeah. And, but you still have people in my generation, who refused to learn to use a computer, who refused to use a cell phone, who refused to go to an ATM, as though the ATMs will disappear. 
The ATMs are here forever. In fact, something else might replace it. Right. We have to learn to adapt to the changing world that we are part of, and to, so that we can we don't live in fear of the world. Too many people live in fear of the world. And there's where I see a connect between yeah. your emotional mastery, fear. principle, consciousness, and purpose, and the removal of fear, mm -hmm. so that there is this openness to yeah. change. Oh yeah, and we need a, we need a lot more of that in the world. So so th there is this uh, issue of culture, mm -hmm. you know, and culture tends to keep us in a kind of state of uh, within a belief system mm -hmm. and so on. Culture and religion. Do they impede our ability to understand and appreciate and, and embrace change? Religion, at the soul of religion, at the heart of religion, religion is, a, is very accommodating of change. But we often build institutions around religion that get stuck in the past, right. stuck in the rituals of some, eh? mm -hmm. and we don't advance with the world as they advance the world. And when, if you go back into the scriptures, the scriptures are quite clear. The scriptures will, will, will have anticipated all of this. And, and, and have, have accommodation. Yeah. Because the scriptures will give you a sense of optimism and hope. Right. Culture very often traps people in the past. And I've had a lot of arguments with what I call the culture folks, <laughs> ministers of culture and so on. Because we have, a lot of us have grown up to seek culture as something that we should cherish and something that we should want to be part of, to be locked into. But you know, I say, you know, until culture changes, humanity cannot advance. Mm -hmm. And if we want humanity to advance, then culture has to change. So ch advancement of humanity is all about the changing of cultures. Right. And we have that little contradiction, we have to get it clear. Because we can't progress until we decide to leave something behind. Right. How can you advance if you want to travel all the baggage of the past? You've got to put some of that baggage down so that we could advance, right. we could progress. Okay. Eh? Yes, because so what I'm hearing from you is that we should participate but not be so trapped that we cannot move forward. Yeah, culture has a beauty to it. It gives us a sense of belonging. It, it ties us with people that we are familiar with and, and right. customs and so on. And we get trapped in it. Let me take a couple of minutes and give you this little experience of mine in South Africa where I lived for a number of years. Um, I lived between 1998 and 2007. When I first arrived in South Africa, I met an English community. I went to an English community in a place called East London. Mm -hmm. And there I met an English community that were trapped in an English culture that England left behind a long time ago. Oh. Okay, you know, the apartheid system, it, tried, it separated people and said you right. have to live within your culture. Culture, yes. So they lived within the culture. Then I went, I got invited to a, a function myself and my wife Gloria in Johannesburg. It was an, an Africana function. That's another big community in South Africa. And when we walked into the function, I nudged I saw the end. I said, wow, you know, this is the 18th century we're looking at here. And everything was so antiquated. They called it, but that was a culture that they arrived, they, those, uh, those are the descendants of the Europeans who arrived right. in South Africa from um, the Dutch and the Germans yeah. and so on. And they came with this culture. And they cherish that culture, and in a sense, they've got trapped within that culture. Then I went to a place called Peter Marysburg, and I met the Indian community. Mm -hmm. You know, South Africa has the, the largest community of Indians outside, outside of India. India. Yeah. And I went to, and I got to know the community pretty, pretty well. And again, I said to myself, wow, this is not the modern day India that I have been reading about. This is an India that these folks left behind a long time ago. But they got trapped in that culture. Mm -hmm. And then later on I went to meet a Zulu community. And, you know, the, and the Zulus now, and I said to myself, wow, they were living in the mud huts and all the rest, trapped in a culture 
that the world has moved away from a long time ago. And the apartheid system said you had to live within your cultures. Mm. As though your culture is defined as though it is static. Right. Now the new South Africa is different. And of course all the, the culture, all the, um, the cultural advocates are complaining about this change in South Africa. Yes. Because South Africa now is a place where everybody is mingling and talking and sharing and the language is getting all mixed up and, and a lot of people haven't accepted that change. Right. Including black folks. Remember a young Zulu guy complaining to me how Zulu culture is changing. Yes. As it interfaces now with, with English and right. this and that. I say, well, what is democracy about? You fought for that, you know. That's Freedom, right. that's what you fought for. That's right. And you have to be prepared now. Human beings got to learn to live together. And as they learn to live together in that new environment, it's a new culture that we're going to evolve. So culture is never static. Culture is there to be changed. And it's that kind of appreciation yeah. and embracing that we yeah. need to, to yeah. understand. And we have to and stop fighting change. Yes. Too much, we spend too much time fighting change when that is the change that we're going to transform us and help us to become better. And, not, and we should not fear it. No, no. Yes. You shouldn't fear it. Well, you see, if you have confidence in, the, in our humanity yeah. and the goodness of our humanity and that more of that goodness is, is emerging as we, as we live, then there's nothing to fear. Thank you very much, Theo, yeah. for sharing on the, the understanding change as one of the five sources of inner power. It was a little difficult to grasp why it belonged as a source of inner power. But you understand um, the importance. But it, the importance is very clear. In now. fact, it is the one source of power that has grown in, in importance within the program. As, as we've been sharing, yeah, over the years. Okay. It has okay. grown in importance. Okay. Yeah. And as important as the others now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing today.